every single man or woman that I had studied who had achieved any kind of success in any field whatsoever had done it after they had made it. And I began to look and I began to compare and I began to talk to people and I speak to thousands of people virtually every month. I found that I never found a single person who was successful who was not excellent at what they did. That competence, the commitment to becoming excellent in your chosen field is an indispensable prerequisite for success that if you are not good at what you do, you haven't got a chance in our competitive society unless you win the lottery. That success is predictable if you commit yourself to becoming excellent. It does a whole lot of other things within your mind, but if you commit yourself to becoming excellent, it changes everything about you. And only the top five or 10% are excellent. You've heard the rule, the 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle, that the top 20% of salespeople make 80% of the sales, that the bottom 80% of salespeople make 20% of the sales. Do you know, do you know what the difference, the ratio is there? The ratio is the difference between 16 to one that the average income of people in the top 20% is 16 times the average income of the people in the bottom 80%. Now, let me ask you a question. Does it mean the people in the top 20% are 16 times better than the people in the bottom 80%? 16 times more experience? Do they work 16 times the number of hours? Do they have 16 times the number of years of education? Are they 16 times more handsome? Are they 16 times anything? You know that it's not humanly possible to be twice as smart as somebody else. Isn't that amazing? And one of the things they found is that the key to this was that each one of these agents had made the commitment to become excellent early in their career. They didn't say, I'm going to go into this and I'm going to earn a living. They said, I'm going to go into this and I'm going to be the best. And they read every single book written by the top agents. And they went to every single seminar and they listened to every single tape. And they spent every single hour they could with other successful people learning what they needed to know to be successful. You must commit yourself to excellence. You must commit yourself to becoming the best. And the wonderful thing is that excellence is a journey. It's not a destination. You never get there. Complacency and satisfaction are the key enemies of excellence. But once you commit yourself to becoming excellent, the whole world opens up for you. A very important point of excellence is this means simply this. Do your best every time out and always strive to do it better. Do your best every time out and always strive to do it better. Remember, it's usually the last 5 or 10% of any job or project that makes all the difference. And what we do is we get to 90% done and then we start to drag our heels. We start to put the paperwork aside. We start to think of excuses. We start to do what is fun and easy rather than what is hard and necessary. A second point with regard to excellence is this, is that if you are not excellent in your field, you don't go anywhere. You're locked in place. I had a young man come up to me at an employment seminar not long ago, and he said, there's no opportunities in sales. He said, I just got laid off. And I said, young man, I said, if you were good in your field, you would not have been laid off because good salespeople are the rarest people in our society. And he just said, well, I said, have you ever studied sales? He said, well, I don't need to study sales. I said, why not? He says, well, I just do what comes naturally. I said, I rest my case. Selling is an art. Selling today is a profession. Selling is a science that in order to be good in selling, you have to study it and study it and study it. And you have to study it more than the person next door who's also determined to become excellent. Excellence yields opportunities because when you become good, you open up. It's almost like the, the red sea of opportunity opens up in front of you. When you become excellent, you come to the attention of people and people try to get you and they give you more responsibilities and more opportunities. And you know, when you put on the, your business card that you are the top person in your particular field, people like to buy from the best salespeople in their fields. And by the way, you can tell how excellent you are at any time. Any time of your life, you can tell how excellent you are. Very simple measure. How many job offers have you had this month? Interesting question. How many job offers? How many people called you up and said, I want to hire you away from where you are and I'll pay you more and give you a better deal? Because excellent people get job offers every month. Some of them get job offers every single week. If you're not getting job offers, the market is telling you this is what they think of your level of competence. Very, very important. And if you're going to do anything at all, the only time you're going to get any joy out of it if you, is if you do it well. You see, when we do something well, it gives us a feeling of self-esteem and pride. We feel like a winner. But if we do things in an average way, it doesn't give us anything. You notice that? It doesn't give us anything. We do it in an average way, it doesn't give us anything. But if we do it in a really exceptional way, it makes us feel wonderful about ourselves. That's why the companies that have committed to excellence are not hundreds of percent better in any given area. What they are is they are one or two percent better in a hundred different areas. That's the key. You see, you don't have to be a quantum leap different from somebody else. You just have to be a little tiny bit different in the critical areas that make a difference. And you, get, you can achieve that simply by making it a goal, setting it as a goal, and working on it. You can become anything that you want to become. The harder you work, the better you get. The harder you work, the better you get. You know, 
in our society today is a lot of controversy over why should I work so hard for my job. The fact of the matter is that less than 5% really succeed. That's less than 5% of the population really succeed at life. Of 100 people working today, only one will be wealthy when they retire. Four will be financially independent, 15 will have some savings, 80% will be broke and dependent upon charities and pensions. Only one or two percent of people in each generation really makes it in life. And in every single study, those people who make it are those who work hard, hard, hard. And if you think that it's hard to be successful, try being a failure. Try coming to the end of the trail with no money, dependent upon pensions, and you don't know what hard is until you try living like that. But if you work hard, the average self-made millionaire in America works 12 to 13 hours a day. Works about 60 to 65 hours a week. I'll tell you this with regard to hard work, that you, in our society, you only work eight hours a day for survival. Everything over eight hours is for success. And if you're only working eight hours a day, you're in trouble. If you're only working eight hours a day, you better have a rich uncle or you better have somebody else who's going to take care of you because eight hours a day only gets you survival in our society because it's so competitive that somebody else is working nine, they've got an edge on you. Somebody else is working 10, they've got a bigger edge on you. Every hour over eight that you invest is an investment in your future is an investment in your success. And if you put in the hours over eight, whether it's studying or reading or working, if you put in the hours, it will pay off and it will pay off in spades. It's like throwing seed in the ground. When you throw a seed in the ground, the plant that comes up is not just one seed, it's hundreds of seeds. There's a crop that you put in, but you must put the seed in the ground first. The market only pays excellent rewards for excellent performance. It pays average rewards for average performance. It pays below average rewards for below average performance. And I talk to men and women all over America who are unhappy and they're sad and they don't like their work. And you know why? It's because they're not good at what they're doing. Well, let me give you a couple of key points. Is first of all, you'll never have a feeling of self-esteem and self-worth. You'll never feel wonderful about yourself until you know that you are good at what you're doing. Number two is if you do not love your work enough to want to be the best at it, get out of it the way you would get out of a burning house. Do not stay at a job that you do not love because it is the high road to failure, dissatisfaction, frustration, and unhappiness in life. Consistency is absolutely critical. You can have all of the others, but if you're inconsistent, it's going to really hurt you. Consistency means that dependable, steady, predictable work is always vastly superior to spurts or flashes of brilliance and genius. That the person who is like the tortoise, who just plods steadily away, old steady Eddie, is always the person who tends to be more successful than the one who flashes here and flashes there, but cannot be counted on over the long term. Be consistent in your relationships, especially be consistent with your family, be consistent with your friends, be consistent with your boss, be consistent in your work. Make, you, make it so that you are the type of person that everybody can depend upon, that people will believe in and they'll depend upon and they know that if you say something, that you'll do it. That if you say you will be somewhere or if you undertake a responsibility, that you will fulfill that responsibility. That sort of consistency, that sort of dependability is one of the most valuable things in the world of work today. I work with so many companies and I have staff that work in my companies and I know that the greatest joy that an employer can have is to give a person a job and know that it'll be done. And the most aggravating thing in the world is to give a person a job and have no idea if it'll be done, if it'll be done to a particular quality, if it'll be done on time or anything else. Just being the steady person. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to one of the things that I found, if I can pass this on to you, one of the things that I found when I was a young man, which helped, this cost me about 10 years of life, by the way, not 10 years so much, uh, but 10 years in that I thought that you had to have good grades in school in order to be successful. And then later I thought that you had to have a university education in order to be successful. And then later I thought that successful people are people who are somehow better than you and I. They somehow have unique talents, that somehow the gods have descended from Olympus and touched them on the heads. But one of the things that I found is that nobody is better than you or I. When you see men or women accomplishing great things, they're not better than you or I. They're not different from you or I. They're just doing things in a different way. You look at a person you went to school with who's now doing surgery as a doctor. The person's the same person, except that they've learned how to do surgery. You look at a person who you went to school with who is now an outstanding success in a particular field. All they've done is learned how to be a success in that field and consistency. There's a, there's a law of accumulation in the universe, if I can pass this on. A law of accumulation that says that even though you do a hundred things or a thousand things that you don't see, eventually they accumulate and they gather a force of their own. That every single great accomplishment in life is the result of thousands of minor accomplishments that nobody ever sees. And in order to move forward, 
You must be motivated, inspired, ambitious. You must have dreams and goals that create ambition. Good ambition, positive ambition. Now ambition does not mean being greedy. It does not mean being selfish. It does not mean getting ahead at the expense of others. Ambition is not greed. Ambition is not avarice and all-consuming desire for wealth. Ambition is not hoping you can win at the expense of others. Do you suppose Judas was ambitious? He ended up with 30 pieces of silver, a fortune in those days. Was Judas successful because he had all that money? No, Judas sold out. Was Judas happy when it was all over with? No, the money didn't make him happy. What he did to get the money certainly didn't make him happy. What Judas became in the pursuit of his fortune caused him to end his own life. What drove him was not ambition. Ambition is not greed. Ambition is an eager desire to achieve, an eager desire to get ahead in life, to do more for your family, to prosper in health, wealth, and relationships. Now, desire does not always translate into ambition. Desire is what you want for yourself. A bigger house, a better car, a fatter bank account, a better life. I desire to have these things. Ambition is how you get there. Desire is sometimes healthy. Desire is sometimes unhealthy. Desire might say, I want the tallest building in town. The destructive side of desire might urge you to tear all of the other buildings down. I guess that's one way to do it. You might get away with tearing down the first one and maybe the second one. But in your desire to tear them all down, sooner or later, some guy is going to be standing out in front of his building saying, I'm on to you, get out of here. And pretty soon you're no longer known as a builder. You're known as a destroyer. Now the second way to have the tallest building in town is to see it, dream it, and plan it, and put your team on it, work on it. Go through all of the steps to get there. Do it right. Have the ambition to be the owner of the tallest building in town. And go through all of the right steps to get there. If you really want it and have the skills to do it and the patience to weather all of the storms, your ambition will lead you there. Having the ambition to do what it takes to get you where you want to go is good. Ambition is creative and constructive. Ambition is an expression. It's something inside of you you want to express in a positive way. I'm sure you have dreams of accomplishing great things. Are you ambitious enough to realize these dreams? Are your dreams strong enough to pull you toward your future? Are they vivid enough to see the end result now? Are they worthy of doing until you get there? What are your reasons for creating these dreams? Reasons vary from person to person. I bet if you did a little soul searching, you could come up with a fairly strong list. The list of reasons. Why is it so important to achieve these dreams? What are you trying to express? These reasons for accomplishing great things are different for everybody. There are personal reasons, sometimes uniquely personal reasons. Some people do well for the recognition. Some people do well because of the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. And that is one of the best reasons. Once in a while I hear someone say, if I had a million dollars, I'd never work another day in my life. Hey, that's probably why the good Lord sees to it that he doesn't get his million, because he would just quit. Family is another reason, a motivator for doing well. Some people do extremely well because of other people. And that's a powerful reason. Sometimes we will do something for someone else that we would not do for ourselves. I know a lady who was getting back on track from financial disaster. Even though she didn't have much of anything left, her primary motivator was to keep her daughter in private school. 
an expensive one, one of the best in the country. Although her goal was to financially surpass where she was before her economic fall, her main reason to work all of those extra hours was to give her little girl the best possible education. As you can well imagine, wanting to do something for someone else led her to all sorts of other accomplishments as well. How fortunate are the people who find themselves greatly affected by someone else? It's powerful. What has you getting up early, hitting it hard all day and staying up late? What has you inspired? What are your reasons for doing well? What's at the core of your quest? What is the power behind your ambition? Think about it. Jot it down. Do some soul searching. Define your reasons so they will work better for you. Next, in enlightened self-interest, life responds to desire. Life responds to deserve, not need. Life was not designed to give us what we need. Life was designed to give us what we deserve. What we deserve. Once you understand that little life principle in your own self-interest, I'm telling you, it's life-changing. The ancient law does not go like this. If you need, you will reap. No, it doesn't work that way. A lot of people out there are hoping it works that way, but no, it doesn't. The ancient law goes like this. If you plant, you will reap. If you sow, you will reap. Somebody says, well, I really need to reap. Well, then you really need to plant in your own self-interest. Your own self-interest needs to be educated in how to plant, how to do it so everybody wins because life doesn't respond to need. You can't go to the soil and say, I need a crop. The soil just smiles at you. And here's what the soil says. Don't bring me your need, bring me some seed. Bring me some effort, bring me some discipline, bring me some interest, bring me some service. Bring me these things and I'll return to you multiplied by two times, five times, 10 times. You can't come with need. You've got to come with seed. You've got to come with willingness. You've got to come with skills. You've got to be willing to learn, willing to change, willing to grow, willing to put yourself out, willing to stand up to the bad weather, willing to pull out the weeds, willing to nurture. That's the only way you get a return. Once you understand these principles, Self-interest now truly becomes an exciting challenge, making sure everybody wins. Enlightened self-interest makes sure that everybody wins. Now here's another one. If you want to find, you must search. And if you search, you will find. In order to find, you must search. You must go to church. You must go to the seminar. You must go to the library. You've got to go to the bookstore. You've got to go to the class. You've got to go to the training. You've got to go searching. Why? If you search, you will find. You'll find ideas. You'll find inspiration. You'll find hope. You'll find contacts. But you've got to be out there on the search, on the look. Life reserves its treasures for those who deserve it, not those who need it. One of the people on the program, uh, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, who had become successful as a singer, they said, isn't it wonderful that you've become so successful? She said, yes, it's wonderful. She said, but when I'm up on stage in Las Vegas and I'm making $50,000 a week or whatever it happens to be, she says, nobody sees the 16 years that I spent traveling around, living in a van, singing in cheap honky-tonks where people throw up on your piano and get drunk 
on the floor in front of you. Nobody sees the 16 years of living on the road, living at an average of less than $5,000 a year. What they see is the person up there on the stage. But every single great success was at one time a failure. And they failed and failed and failed and failed over and over again. And all great successes are a story of failure, 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 outstanding success. Boy, ain't he lucky. Isn't that right? Boy, he was lucky. He sure had the right connections. <clears throat> so consistency is important. And even if you don't see yourself getting the results, be consistent. Keep working. Steady, 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 knowing that you're accumulating. You're putting yourself on the side of the angels when you're working consistently. Finally, with regard to consistency, guard your integrity as a sacred thing. As Ralph Waldo Emerson said, nothing at last is sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Never compromise your integrity for anything and never compromise your peace of mind for anything. You see, compromising your peace of mind is a way of compromising your integrity. Never do anything that disrupts your peace of mind. If it makes you feel unhappy, get out of it. Don't stay in relationships, don't stay in jobs, don't stay in situations that cause your peace of mind to be disrupted because your peace of mind is the highest good that you have. And a person who practices consistency consistently structures their life so what they are doing is being true to themselves. What they are doing is living up to the very best that is in them as a human being. And that takes tremendous courage. It takes tremendous courage because it's so easy to go along with a crowd. But you'll never be really happy unless you know that you are being true to yourself uh, and completely true to yourself. I have found that the ability or the willingness to make a complete commitment to a job, a commitment to a relationship, a commitment to a profession, to make a commitment is one of the hardest things that human beings do. That very few people make commitments. That most people in this room, I hate to say it, most people in this room are not totally committed to their work. Oh yeah, they're doing it, uh, they're in it, they're doing a reasonably good job, nobody's fired them yet, right? But they're not committed, their whole heart isn't into it. And yet no success is possible without commitment. Who is it that Emerson said that every great achievement is the triumph of enthusiasm? That the ability to commit yourself enthusiastically, wholeheartedly, 100% to what you want to do is the starting point of all achievement? That if you cannot commit yourself wholeheartedly, it probably means that it's not right for you? And that all of us in life seek for something that we can commit ourselves to. Alan Cox in his book, The Achievers, which came out last year, found that the executives in the corporations that he studied who achieved the very most in the shortest period of time had found the proper niche for themselves and had lost themselves in their work. Dr. Shrelly Blotnick's study of self-made millionaires, 83 out of 1,500 people became self-made millionaires over 20 years. He found that the one quality that they all had in common was that they picked work that they loved, they specialized in that work, they became very good in it, and they eventually became paid very well for it, and then they held on to the money. I throw that last one in because I know a lot of you can relate to that. They held on to the money. They didn't gamble or speculate. They were very conservative with their money. They got paid more and more, and they held on to it. One of them started off cleaning toilets on the night shift for an airline. And today he's the president of the airline and makes $1,950,000 a year. I've been with the airline for 35 years, but it's not easy to be, not difficult to become a millionaire when you're making $1,950,000 a year, even with taxes, you can still do pretty well. He found that the quality that separated these people from the ones who struggled for 20 years and weren't much further ahead than when they started was that they became totally absorbed in their work, totally committed to their work. They lost themselves in their work, and when they lifted up their head about the age of 43, 44, their accountant told them, by the way, you're worth over a million dollars now. Did you know that? Most of them became wealthy without even knowing it. And so it's important that you find the work. It's important that you find the relationship you can commit yourself to. And if you are an employer and you have people working for you who are not committed to their work, these people are like rotten apples in a barrel. I have found that people who are not committed to their jobs are people who will always cause trouble within an organization. And that people who are committed, they don't, you don't have to be the most talented and you don't have to be the best looking, you don't have to be the best educated, but if you're committed to your work, you'll do more than all the people with all of those blessings. So commitment is important. Commit yourself to your boss, Commit yourself to your job, commit yourself to your relationships, commit yourself to your company. Loyalty is one of the most valued single qualities in work. And Peter Drucker says that more executives fail in life because of lack of loyalty. Go confidently in the direction of your dreams. Act as go confidently in the direction of your dreams and act 
as though it were impossible to fail. And this brings us to the most important part, if I can just summarize in one minute, it is this, is that your true beliefs are only and always expressed in your actions. It is not what you say or what you intend that tells what you believe, but only what you do. Your actions are always the true measure. And the interesting thing that we've learned in behavioral psychology is this, that if you do not feel self-confident, courageous, consistent, like concentrating, clear, and so on, if you don't feel like it, and most of us start off not feeling like it, if you will act the part, if you will pretend as though you have the quality already, the feelings will generate the actions and the actions will generate the feelings. That if you will act, walk, talk, and live by the same principles and do the same things that successful men and women do, even if you doubt yourself in the initial stages, eventually you will come to the point where you actually feel to the bottom of your soul like a successful, positive, confident, cheerful, optimistic, unstoppable human being. And that's the key. Act the part until you feel the part. Enlightened self-interest, giving so that you will receive, searching so that you will find, making sure that everybody wins all the way around. Enlightened self-interest needs to be educated. Enlightened self-interest says, I will learn that life is not just the passing of time. I will learn that life is the collection of experiences, ups and downs, highs and lows, laughter and tears. You must decide to act. You must have the discipline to act. Now here's what's important about discipline. One discipline affects another discipline. All disciplines affect each other. In fact, here's a good philosophical phrase. Everything affects everything else. Nothing stands alone. Don't be naive and say, this doesn't matter. Of course it matters. It all matters. Some things may matter more than others, but everything matters. If you'd rather sleep in than go for a walk around the neighborhood, pretty soon it will matter. If you'd rather spend your money instead of saving it, pretty soon it will matter. If you'd rather put off a letter to an old friend instead of corresponding regularly, pretty soon it will matter. If you'd rather work late every night instead of going home and spending time with your family, pretty soon it will matter. It all matters. Every letdown affects the rest. If you won't walk around the block, you probably won't eat right. And you probably won't buy the books, and you probably won't attend the seminars, and you probably won't spend your money wisely, and after years of this, it all adds up. So the key to reversing this process is to start picking up the disciplines. It does matter. It all matters. Now, here's the positive side. Every new discipline affects the rest. Every new discipline makes a difference. That's why action is so important. The smallest action, the least action, the action that you won't think will matter. It all matters. Take it. Because when you start accomplishing and the value starts to return, you'll find inspiration to do the next one and the next one and the next one. If you start walking around the block, it'll inspire you to start eating right. You start eating right, it'll inspire you to get a book. You get a book and it'll inspire you to get a journal. You get a journal and it'll inspire you to develop some skills. Disciplines affect each other. Lack affects the rest of your life. The key is to diminish the lack. One of our greatest temptations is to just ease up a bit. To do just a little bit less than you're capable of. To take a little break. Somebody says, it'll just affect my sales. No, it'll affect your consciousness. It'll affect your philosophies. It'll affect your home life. It'll affect everything. No, you can't ease up a bit. That's what vacations are for. When you're at work, work. When you're on vacation, rest. Wherever you are, be there. If you think about vacation when you're at work, you'll surely think about work when you're on vacation. You'll just mess it all up. So be disciplined. Get involved. Do all that it takes to get the job done. Get your health back. 
Get your bank account where it's supposed to be. Get your family in order. Get disciplined, be disciplined every day. When you set up the disciplines that give your life structure, miracles can happen. Multiply. And I'm telling you, anybody who wants to make a drastic change in their income can do it. I was broke at age 25 and a millionaire at age 31. Everything around me was the same. I changed. I refined my philosophy. I read the books. I took the classes. Started looking at life a little differently. I'm telling you, it works. Now, there are six principles of building ambition. That These principles work together, creating and directing energy. Directing your energy toward achievement. Directing your energy toward self-expression. Right now, we'll touch on the six principles in definition only. And later in the program, we'll get into each one separately. Here they are, the six principles of building ambition. Number one, positive self-direction. Knowing who you are and where you want to go. Accumulating the knowledge and being prepared for opportunities that come your way. Number two, self-reliance. Taking responsibility for your own life. Taking responsibility for whatever happens to you. Knowing that you have made the conscious decisions that are now affecting your life. That what's happening in your life is the direct result of your activity. Counting on you. Number three. Self-discipline. Ambition at the daily level. Knowing that you can reach your goals one step at a time, one day at a time, one activity at a time. And doing everything it takes to get there. Every day. Number four, self-enterprise. Consistently being able to create opportunity. And consistently being able to take advantage of it. Being aware enough to see it. Skilled enough to make it work for you. Number five, working with others. We must make ourselves stronger to benefit us all. We must succeed at the service of others. Learning how to take your skills, enterprise, reliance, and direction to the table to create true success. And the sixth principle of building ambition is self-appreciation. Appreciate your accomplishments. Appreciate your potential. Knowing that in one day you completed all you set out to do. Fueling your ambition by fueling your appreciation of yourself. Each of these principles, when activated correctly, help to develop your ambition, your eager desire to get more out of life, to gain wealth, to gain prosperity, to have a better family, to build a better business. All of these principles work together in creating and directing energy toward achievement and self-expression.